and you get really comfortable with it, at some point you just can't do it without it. Okay. Those of you who haven't been here, um, my name is Roy Oshrov. Um, I'd love to uh, have you over for a course I'm running during August. If you want, you just go to this URL. Why does Windows always have this, like, when you do a presentation? <gasps> I'm thinking. Um, my book just came out. Anyone actually just bought it? Wow, that's cool. Thank you. Can I get a copy? Okay. Um, it took me three years to write this book and two kids. I started this book, book with no kids. Now I have two. And this book took longer to make than both of them. And somehow it's much more quiet. In fact, it took so much time to write this book that I actually changed my mind about some things during writing it. And I had to go back and change them in the actual book. I won't tell you what it was, though. Okay, I'll tell you what, maybe later. This is the second talk in our unit testing series, the TDD stuff. Um, this is not just about how to write unit tests, how to write them test first. This is how not to write them, or how to write them well. It takes uh, a large portion of the book as well. I think it's a really important chapter. Uh, and I think this is uh, one of the things that most people don't implement. There are three pillars to making unit tests good. And when I say good, I mean three things. You trust your tests. Tests are trustworthy. You are able to maintain your code and your tests, and it doesn't take up too much time. That is, you feel that you get more value from the tests, and maintaining them uh, does not hurt you. And the tests are readable. If they're not readable, the rest actually falls down as well. These three things are connected. Now, to make your test trust trustworthy, there are several things that we can go through. Um, let's just start with the, the simple stuff. Uh, in my class, uh, when I teach test-driven development, I say, start with the failing test. And people say, OK, let's write a failing test. And they write something like this. They say they call sum with one and two, and they expect to get four. Of course, this test will fail. And now they have a chance to go and write production code. But of course, this test is wrong. This is an obvious way of writing a test that you cannot trust. It's just making it really, really obvious. But so I actually saw people do this. Um, and this is just lack of experience. They said, write a test that fails. But it's not just writing a test that fails. The test has to fail, but then pass when you change the production code. So if you start with a failing test, but then you change the production code and the test keeps failing, it's probably an indication that the test might be wrong. Or if you start with a test and you can't get it to fail, probably an indication that the test is wrong. And one of the cool things about TDD is that it helps you test the test. Just imagine having a bug in your test. How long would it take you to find it? The interesting thing about TDD is that you have to see a test fail and then you see it pass. That is, you see the test in both situations. So you know that the test is correct. If you write the test after, because we are programmers and we are not objective about what we write, we write tests that are supposed to work. We cannot trust ourselves. With test driven, you have to write a test that fails so that you will see it in that situation. So that you know that it fails when it should and passes when it should. And that's one of the reasons that I think TDD actually makes for better tests, because you will have tests with less bugs. You will find the bugs much early when writing the test as well. Because no one will write a test for the test, right? Because that test could have a bug as well, and so on. Recursive descent. Um, but these things can actually be uh, much, uh, uh, these bugs can actually be, be much more subtle. I want to uh, show you an example uh, of a bug in the code that we wrote earlier. Now, if you weren't at the previous session, don't worry. It's a very simple piece of code. I'm going to explain it. Um, we just have a method called SumString. It takes a string of numbers, and it uh, handles zero numbers and handles one number perfectly. Well, I think. We don't have enough tests yet. Um, and there are other methods here. But I want to, uh, let's assume that we have a method here that we wrote. I'm not going to write it test-driven, just to make a point. 
public uh, string uh, create num string uh, int i int x or is it int x int y int y oh much better and what this function returns is um, what was it? Is a string format? It would be the first number, comma, the second number. So we have one and zero, and we have x and y. Okay. So this function takes two numbers, creates a string with a comma between them. That's all I want. Forget about why I want it. I just want to show that even the simplest code uh, and that has tests, those tests can have bugs. Very, very subtle bugs. Now let's say that we are writing a test for this code. And we write a test that looks like this. And I'm going to use my naming convention because we're going to cover it anyway. Let's say that the name of the method under test is create num string. Now the scenario is two simple numbers. So behavior returns string with comma between. Now this test name may seem a bit long, but remember the tests are also API documentation. So I don't care that the name is long, I care that it's readable. I want people to be able to read it like a sentence. And yes, I have no problem doing this, for example or doing this, for example. This is not regular production code. This is should be more readable than production code. Because bugs here and un misunderstandings here will lead to bugs that are much more serious in production code. Okay. Now I would say uh, string calc sc equals new string calc sc create num string and I would send in 1 and 2. And let's create a result. And assert, and a lot of people do this, are equal. And I'm expecting, what would be that uh, number? Let's just go here and do this. One and two and the actual string, the result. Nothing wrong with that, right? It's a perfectly legitimate test, right? I'm sorry, what? I just heard a no, 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 no. No, why not? Who said that? Why not? OK, I duplicated the logic, but it's very simple logic. What's the problem? What's the problem? I mean, seriously, this is what people would tell you. What is the problem? I mean, there's obviously not a bug here, right? So can anyone tell me what the problem is? Of course, duplicating the, the logic is a problem. Why is it a problem? Sorry? I'm not testing it, and I have to refactor the test as well. Well, I'm not testing it, but I am testing it. I'm writing it in a test. Oh yeah, okay, I'm testing that the logic that I think is correct is indeed what I think it is. Did you get that? I didn't check the end result. I, because I repeated the same logic in the code, inside my test, the bug that I may have already created is inside my test as well. So I will always get a positive result even though the bug exists because I'm actually expecting the bug to exist here because I recreated it in my tests. So recreating the same logic from your production code in your tests brings a high possibility of a real bug, even if it's simple code. It's much better to use consts or end results. For example, I would say um, 1 and 2. I don't care how you got 1 and 2. I just care that you got it. I know this is what the string needs to look like. Okay, Now, if my code has a bug and I get a different string, I will know about it. Because what I care in unit test is about the current end result. So 
So by default, unit tests for, should not have logic. And as far as I'm concerned, creating or appending strings is just as much logic as loops, switch cases, and all that stuff. Now, this gets even more serious if you think about people. And I've done this. A lot of people do this. Um, they say, OK, I want to test this. I'm going to create a random number generator. And I'm going to take two numbers each time. And I'm going to create the string that's supposed to happen from those two numbers and assert that it's equal every time. That sounds cool, right? But remember that you will still have to recreate the same logic in that test. Um, just imagine that the two numbers here, x and y, are created randomly. That also means that you, every time you run this test, you get a different test. You're testing with different numbers. Um, but of course, the possibility of the logic itself having a bug is very, very large. So I wouldn't necessarily say that random numbers are bad inside tests just that they're not really unit tests as far as I'm concerned. And write them, but only after you write the regular ones, like the simple ones. When you know the logic is OK, and you just want to test the range of values and all that stuff. OK, very simple stuff. Let's do this. A lot of people stop trusting the tests because uh, they remove tests or they change existing tests when they shouldn't do that. Uh, for example, someone writes a test, the test passes, so I say, okay, now let's make this test much more, uh, uh, um, let's say, complex. So they go to the existing test and they start changing it. And of course, this is a problem because once we have a test I, and it passes, I don't want you to, to remove it or to change it because this, that test should still be there even a year from now as far as I'm concerned to always test that this specific piece of use case still works. So think of it about it like tracks in, uh, well, I come from Israel. I usually say tracks in the sand. But I'll say tracks in the snow for you guys. So think about it like tracks in the snow. Test, you always want to see all the tracks that you left behind. You always want to recreate your steps so that you uh, will not miss even one. Because even if you miss one, there could be a bug there. So never change or remove tests except these specific cases. One of the only times that you remove a test case is when it's invalid. If you do test-driven development, you start with a failing test, you make it pass, and then you have a requirement that actually passes. You have a requirement. Now you get a new requirement six months later, and you, and you write a failing test, you make it pass, and suddenly as that new test passes, some old test that you don't even remember writing fails. And you realize, after playing with it for a second, that these two tests cannot live together. They are opposing tests. So they uh, represent conflicting uh, requests, conflicting uh, uh, requirements. And this is a good indication for you to go and ask the person who gave you the requirements which one should go. One of them is probably invalid. They cannot live together. Most of the time, that's what happens. Um, you can change tests, but o without changing the functionality. For example, you can change the name of a test to make it more readable. You can refactor the test to make it more maintainable. But it still needs to do the same thing that it did. You don't want to change the functionality because you're actually changing the test itself. You're changing the use case being tested. Um, the only other times where you are forced to change a test without just wanting to refactor it um, is when the semantics of using the code have changed. So let's take a look at the string calc class. Um, let's say that I get a new requirement that says, um, before, uh, cr uh, before working with create calc, uh, with calc string uh, every time, you need to call a special init method. It's a special requirement. If you don't call the init method and you call any other method, you're going to get an exception. What does that mean about all the other tests that I already have? They won't work. They will fail by default. But they are still important. They still test the right things. But the semantics of using that class have now changed. So I will need to go to all those tests and start, cha uh, start making them call the init method at the beginning. Now this is also a maintainability issue, and I will cover that. But this is one other case. I won't show it. Uh, we don't have enough time. It's uh, only have an hour. But uh, this is one case where you need to change tests. 
for most other cases, there is no reason, there should not be any reason for changing or removing them at all. Um, there are code coverage tools out there. If you, uh, if you want to be able to trust your tests, you want to know that they have good code coverage. So if you have tests, 1,200 tests in your code, but you're only covering 20%, are you going to trust your tests? They're all passing. Does that mean anything to you? Eh, it means something. It doesn't mean you should stop debugging, though. But if you have 95% code coverage with 1,200 tests, that means a lot. So low code coverage means something. It means you need to do more code coverage. High code coverage also means something, but only if the tests are good. Because I've seen tests that do a lot of code coverage, but they don't really check anything. They just execute the code. So these two things have to live together. So I'm assuming those tests are actually testing the right thing and, and so on. So now code coverage actually does matter. Um, so there are code coverage tools out there. MS Test has the built-in code coverage, and there is NCover. There are other tools. Anyone here use other tools than those two that I just mentioned for code coverage? Anyone? Just shout it out. I want to hear about other tools. No one. Okay. Who, you, who actually uses one of those two? Okay. Not enough people. You should start using those, either NCover or MS Test. Very, very popular, very simple tools. Um, one of them comes built in, one doesn't. Um, but what I want to show is a different technique. I want to show a technique that I use in test reviews. And test reviews is something that I do every time someone checks in code at, uh, at our company. I mean, seriously, you cannot check in code without going through a review. It doesn't have to be by me, though. But this is one of the practices that we, uh, that we implement. And that makes sure that every code gets, a, gets their share of respect to, to see if there is any what, what I call crappage. Uh, now, tests can be really, really crappy if you let them. And people need to learn how to write good tests. So tests need to be reviewed as well. Um, and all the things that I'm going to say here also need to be reviewed. But one of the things that I want to make sure, instead of just running code coverage, is I, sh I actually check things manually. So I will go into various logic places, such as ifs or loops or consts, and start changing them. Just change one at a time, run all the tests. I'm putting an obvious bug there. Something should be failing, right? Now, if all the tests still pass, I know there's a problem. Now, why do I do it manually? Why not run using code coverage? Can anyone tell me? As I drink this. The reason is it's, it's more intimidating that way. Well, actually, uh, it makes me look at the code more because I do code review and, uh, and the test review as well. I want to see what's being tested, how it's being tested, the structure of the code as well. But also, uh, you pay more attention. You just don't just uh, let a tool take all the decisions for you. You want to see code quality. You want to see how things mix together. Sometimes you see things that even code coverage doesn't catch, such as testing things in the wrong way. Uh, um, here's an example. Now I have tests for string calc. If I go to create num string, not create num string, let's go to sum string. Now there, there isn't a whole lot of logic here. But the simplest thing I could do is to go inside the if here and change this to true. An obvious bug. Run all the tests. If nothing fails, oh dear God, you have a problem. You have a problem with me, that is. Um, uh, if something fails, that's okay. I'm going to change it to false and see what happens. Um, I'm going to, uh, to uh, move this line to be the first line. So the if never happens. Just to see what happens. Run all the tests. It, uh, it does make a difference. It makes you pay more attention as the reviewer. And I think it's a great technique. Um, one other thing is that there used to be a tool for Java that uh, used to do this automatically is to mingle your code and see what happens. I don't think there is specific code for that in .NET. I would love to be, uh, to be taught if there is something like that. So if anyone knows something, either shout it out now, which I know you want because you're Norwegian. But you can send me an email, which will be on the slides. You see, I didn't even wait for you to shout. 
Um, so avoid test logic. I started talking about this earlier. There should absolutely be no test logic in your tests. If there is an if, you're probably testing more than one thing. If there is a switch, you're obviously testing more than one thing. Um, now, the reason is because it's very likely that you're going to have a bug there. I say 95%, even for simple tests. Why 95%? Because Murphy's Law says that if it's a really simple test, and this is like, and you say, you know what, screw that. I'll just put in some logic this time. 95% that test is going to have a bug. Okay? It just happens. I don't know why it happens. This is from experience. So save, save yourself the trouble. And of course, if you were doing test-driven uh, development, you would have found that out very easily because either the test might have a bug so you would have found it, or you would write a much simpler test. With test-driven, uh, you write tests that are much simpler. If you write the test later, you usually write tests that check more things. <coughs> and of course, there's the logic that is being recreated from the production code like I showed earlier. Um, this is something really important. You have to separate the unit tests from the integration tests um, if you want developers to trust the test results. It doesn't come easily to realize this, but this happened to me so many times that uh, I realized that that's the only way. So just imagine a developer getting the latest version <coughs> of uh, all the source code from source control, and they're right-clicking and running all the tests in the solution. And some tests pass, some tests fail. Now, the developer who wrote the test that fails goes to you and says, what do they say? Come on. It's supposed to fail. You didn't configure that. That's not connected. Oh, that's a problem. Don't worry about it. No, it only fails every second time. If it's the third time that it fails, but that other test passed, you're OK. If that test passed, but it's a full moon, there's a problem. If you hear that, any one of those, including the full moon, there are applications out there that have to do with astrology. I'm not kidding. What, a full moon is like a leap year? You have to take advantage of something like that in software that has to do with something like that. These are problems in tests. Now, you solve these problems by writing tests better and isolating them better. But regardless of that, when you have integration tests, that is tests that are not necessarily only running in memory or that touch external resources or that run really slow or that use threads or that are not repeatable, then you probably need some configuration uh, to run them. And by default, you don't have that. So you may think that the test is failing for the right reasons. It's failing because you didn't configure it. But remember, that developer who got your source code and started running your test and now it fails and you tell them it's OK, they will not trust the test anymore. Because it fails, but you think it's OK. So you need to be able to trust your test. You want to know that when it fails, it should fail. And when it doesn't, it doesn't. So at least, at the very least, if you have tests that need configuration by default, put them in a separate project. And that project I call the integration tests. And all the unit tests go in a different project called dot unit tests in the end. And now the project with the unit tests, all the tests there should pass by default. It's always supposed to be green. I get the latest version, and I run them. And if one fails, I know there's a problem. There should not be, oh, OK, it's supposed to fail. This is a unit test. Because I specifically separated them. So we now, if it fails, I now have real value. I actually believe the test. So at the very least, separate those. And those that need configuration, put them in a separate project and put you know, all those explanations of how to make it pass and all that stuff. So at least you have that safe green zone. This is what I call uh, that, that kind of stuff, where a developer can run them and feel at least partially confident about those specific tests. They can believe they can trust those tests. That's about trustworthiness. What about maintainability? Um, one of the things that uh, I dislike doing is to test methods that are not public. Not because uh, Uncle Bob said so, but uh, because ultimately, 
it's a practice that will deteriorate your test. They will make very, very fragile tests. It's not productive. Now, I'll explain how that leads to better design in a second. Um, Ula, how long do we have, just to make sure? Not five minutes, right? 30 minutes, okay. You remember, if you have five minutes left, you have to start dancing all like this. Because less, less time he was. <sighs> You're not getting a shirt. <laughs> okay, so why should I test public stuff? Public stuff, by default, is a contract. You say to the outside world, this is how I should work. This is, these are the methods you should use. If it's private or protected, it's uh, changeable because no one should be touching it from the outside. So that means that if I write tests by default against private or protected stuff, it's more likely, much more likely, that my tests will fail for the wrong reasons. I change the name of the method, I change the parameters, I refactor it to multiple different methods, and suddenly the tests now need to change because the semantics of that method have changed. It's just going to happen much more than with public methods. So just for the productivity reason, it's not a good idea. Second, it could be a design smell. Because if you really want to test that method, maybe, maybe the test is telling you that method really wants to be public. Maybe it should be static. Maybe it, sh it should be in a different class. I don't think it's a bad thing that the test tells you that something needs to change in your design. I just think it should be your choice whether you want to change it or not. I don't want it to be a necessity. Um, and that's one of the main arguments about the whole idea of design for testability and all that stuff. How much do you let your test change your design or how much do you let your test force your design? That's the main argument that I, that I hear most of the time. And a lot of people, and I think I agree, a lot of people think that if you have such a smell, you probably want to change your design. But there are times where you can't and that's where I want you to have the choice. That's where things fall apart. In the real world, you can't always write new code. You have legacy code, and that legacy code has requirements, or you have security requirements, you have optimization requirements, whatever. And you can't always do what the test really, really yells at you to do. You just can't. Um, there are always ways around this. The design can always be better, and I think it can be made better, and re be refactored to be better, but you need tests to make that happen. So you can even, even do integration tests and all that stuff before you do unit tests, and then you can change your design. Um, so that's why I specifically uh, wrote, sometimes there, there isn't any choice about this. And from consulting to large companies and small companies, I think it's naive to say, from now on, I do test driven everywhere, and all my design is solid design. I'm not saying <laughs> I wouldn't love that to happen. I'm saying that in the real world, you can only do incremental changes. If you're doing a new project, I think you can do this kind of stuff if you really knew how to do it. But on an existing project, it's going to be much more uh, difficult to do. And that's where you might want to start with just unit testing or just integration testing and then changing the design and all that stuff. Incremental work is the key with any, with any place where you don't specifically have choices about the design stuff. Reusing test code is one of the key pillars uh, that make tests maintainable. I showed an example of, I'll just show you the, the code that we wrote in the previous uh, um, talk. The code that I wrote here may be readable, but it's hardly maintainable. If you'll notice, all the tests here, can you guys in the back read the code? If you can't yell, we can't read. We can't read because it's too small, not because you can't read. Okay. You can't hear me, can't you? Okay. So this is a problem because I'm creating an instance of string calc in all those tests. So if I were to go to the constructor of string calc and add a parameter, I would have all these tests breaking. Now, there are several ways to fix this. 
Um, what most people do is they use a setup method, and this is part of any test framework. You have setup, uh, set up, uh, set up attribute, public, void, setup, doesn't really matter what the name is. And whatever code you put in the setup method is going to be executed once for each test. So if I have five tests here, the code in the setup method will be run five times when I run all the tests in the class. Um, so you can refactor into say uh, string calc uh, equals new string calc and in the setup initialize it okay so the difference is now I have the string calc uh, as outside the tests and if you think about this like a constructor that runs before each test each test will get a new instance of string calculator which is very good because it means that each one of them does not touch the state of string calc that the others will have. So the tests are more isolated this way. Now setup methods are great uh, for this specific use because in this case this is the class under test. So I can just go ahead and remove all the places in the tests where I have SC calc. I do this once. That's why it's important by the way to start doing this refactoring as soon as you are using this thing more than once do it on the second test and you won't have to go to each line in the test and start removing that kind of stuff um, but what happens when you have another class that's being used but it's not being used by all the tests this is nice because it and it's still kind of readable because whoever reads the test code will look at the setup and say okay so you have a string calc for all the tests but if some tests use another object and some of them don't and you initialize it in the setup method you're gonna get some garbage the person who reads the test is gonna have a problem because they're gonna see the setup method and they're going to, to think that the second object is also being used by all the tests and they're gonna start searching where it's used where it's not used and so on and suddenly the tests become very unreadable very confusing and you wanna prevent that from happening so the second option, if you want to create objects that are not used in all the uh, set uh, in all the tests, is to use simple factoring methods. So imagine if I was to just refactor this into a uh, extract method here and say create default calc. Um, now I actually have a naming convention for that it calls make underscore. Um, the reason for having a naming convention here is uh, to say this is a method that creates an object. So it's like a naming convention because you can have multiple helper methods in your tests. So you see all the make methods in the IntelliSense as well, one after the other, and so on. So it's easier to read the code. Now I don't have to put this in the setup anymore. I can just go and do this uh, var sc equals make default calc. So now I'm, I'm not creating it in the setup. I may create this directly in all my tests, but it's more maintainable because the, the call to the constructor happens only in a single method. So if I change the constructor, I only have to change a single method and all the tests will suddenly just magically work. So that's how I fix things, by refactoring the code. Now there is a fine line between readability and refactoring. You can quickly get over that line. I recommend that you make the tests more readable than maintainable if the choice ever comes across. Okay? For example, um, if, if the test is not understandable just because you created a factory method, I wouldn't recommend creating the factory method. I would recommend taking the hit of the maintenance because being able to read the test and understand what it does is, I think, even more important than, than the maintainability. Because if you're not e able to read it, even if it's maintainable, you won't be able to maintain it. Because you won't understand what it does. So one of them has higher, higher order. It doesn't happen that often. I've almost never had to deal with this question of how much is too much refactoring. Mostly what I'm going to show here is perfectly readable. Um, so creating objects is one type of helper method. Now let's imagine that case where I said what hap um, now you need to uh, call an init method on string calc before calling, calling it. So I can just put that in the make default calc if I wanted to. 
call the init method on it. And now all the tests by default call it. Uh, but maybe only some tests need to call init and some don't. So what would happen then? I can't put it in the default calc because then all the tests would be having the same behavior, right? I would say, uh, um, oh, I, I'm doing a recursive uh, kind of thing here. That's nice. New uh, string calc. Um, so this happens here. Var sc equals make default calc. So this is what my test would look like. So if I was going to do this uh, sc dot init, let's say it's some method, you have to call it before doing any other operations. If I do this, now all my tests by default get this behavior. I don't want all of them to get this behavior, so I can have a, speci a special method that I would just change the state of the object to a specific way. Oh, I'm returning the wrong object. There you go. Wow, you guys find bugs. You're shy, but you're good. I like that. I like that a lot. This is pair programming, isn't it? What? Should be avoid. SC is an attribute. Oh, it's a field. Well, I don't care if it's field right now. But this is definitely a, test, uh, a code smell. Who care? Uh, it doesn't really have to be a field. I can just initialize it like this, right? And of course, every every little thing like this helps to create a more confusing code. So we just cleaned up the code, and you know, just because this is a presentation, and I'm excited. I keep screwing up, but you guys catch me. And I like that. Okay, what else? Um, now I have to make all the tests. Uh, compile because you told me to remove the field. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to do undo now. Okay. And what else? I'll just do this. SC equals make default calc. There you go. What do you think of that? Okay. Now some test needs some, <laughs> some state and I'm going to continue to try and do this. Let's say that some need to call in it. I would uh, say in this test after I got the instance of uh, string calc, I would maybe have a method that says change state or some form of a specific method. Now I usually call this method init, but because uh, the example also changes a method calling init, then it would be too weird. So if, you could, if, you, if I would just go change uh, call init on SC, uh, and calling init is just a logical step initialize and this method would be just a helper method where maybe two or three tests out of ten are using then uh, string calc would uh, would change its state but only for those tests but whoever reads the test will understand that I'm changing the state to a specific way but it would still be maintainable so I would have helper methods for creation and I would have helper methods for uh, changing state of an object now the last case is to have helper methods for assertions. How can we refactor this into assertions? If you look at all these tests, they all look the same. Well, these are uh, length without spaces. Let's look at the, the sum string that we had. We have the sum string method here. We only have uh, two tests for it, but I want to refactor them. Just imagine we have more. So we have one that, cre that calls some string with an empty string, expects zero. We have one that calls some string with a number, expects one. Now, I, what I can do is I can say, let's make uh, a, g a more generic method that takes parameters. Now, if, it, it's, if it's more generic and it contains an assert inside it, I would probably say assert underscore some string results. Now I'm going to refactor this so that instead of sending hard-coded values, it's going to take parameters. I'm going to use resharper here. Uh, if you use resharper, this might be interesting to you. Um, I can extract a parameter. So I can say, uh, make the empty string a parameter. Call it numbers. 
um, and make the expected result into a parameter as well. Call it expected. Now, instead of this test being two lines, I can just say assert with an empty string that you get zero. So the test becomes one line. Now this is this makes the test uh, somewhat more um, not only maintainable, uh, a bit more readable, but it's I I think this actually might make it not as readable as I would like. So at the very least, I would say that uh, I would call this the expected, uh, not a, not a variable. Sorry, uh, make it a variable here. Int expected, so that I know what this is and make this a variable as well. String numbers. And the reason is, I want the reader of the test to understand what's being sent. Now in C Sharp 4.0, you'll be able to specify the names of the parameters in the method call itself. So that you can make the test more readable that way. If you were programming in VB.NET, who programs in VB as well, by the way? Some people here? OK, I'm a VB dev, by the way. I mean, I started in VB 5 and 6. Now I do both. Uh, um, VB has a cool feature where you can already name your parameters, by the way. So you can make these tests more readable by default already today. But in C Sharp, you have to do this right now. So now I have all these tests calling this specific method. I can do the same thing here. And if by any chance the way that I assert or I call some string has changed, uh, I only need to change one function. So now I can uh, have these two tests, but there is further refactoring that I can do. Um, if you are using NUnit or MBUnit, NUnit has a feature that's called row tests. Anyone here ever use that? Okay, maybe just one person, two people. Uh, a row test um, provides the next step in this kind of thing. Let's say that you have the same test and you want to send just different values every time. What I can do is instead of making this, calling this from other tests, I can just say, let's call it a test case. This is a new attribute in NUnit 2.5. And in the test case, you just specify values of arguments. So the first value will be mapped to the first parameter of the method. So I'm saying that an empty string, I'm expecting zero. And here's another test case. With just one, I'm expecting one. And here's another, if I really wanted to. One and two, I'm expecting three. And you can give them names and descriptions as well. And this way, I don't even need this or this. Because this specifies the same idea. Take a look at this clean cleanliness and sim simplicity. It's readable. It's understandable. Uh, because it's an attribute, you can actually give names to the parameters here. So you can make it even more readable. And this actually counts as three tests. If I run this using either NUnit or testdriven.net, you can see that the, the third failed. Two passed, one failed. The one that failed is this one, which is obvious because we still don't handle two numbers. We only handle zero or one number. We worked incrementally. Um, I think that's about it for refactoring and reuse. I think that's pretty cool. Now, if you're using MS Test, MS Test has a different thing. It's more powerful if you're doing a lot of range checking. You can kind of use it for the same thing. There is, um, in, any, in, in the MS test, there is a property. When you generate a new test, when you create new test class, there is a property that's generated as a comment called test context. Now, has anyone here ever used that? Mm, yeah, you up there. OK, and you down there. Hey, you guys should talk. The test context, are you guys from the same company? You don't know who I'm talking about, though. How can you say no? The test context is pretty powerful. It gives context to the test. You can put special attributes on the test that say, I want you to, to get data from a specific data source, like Excel or a database. And for each row in the data, I want you to put it in a property on the test context object. 
So instead of a test having parameters in MS Test, the test takes the parameters from a specific row on the test context. So the test context actually has a data set that it loaded from the database. And each time of running a test, it will run the same test for each row in that table in the database. So it's kind of like that, but it's not hard coded as attributes. You can use it with millions of rows. The difference is it's less readable. You don't know all those values. And it's not great for very simple scenarios. It's really good for uh, a long ranges of uh, values. It's really powerful. And if you think about MS Test, who's not really built for unit testing, it can do some unit testing, but it was really built for just testing. And is that it's a great uh, system. And that system has range values and all that stuff. So you have a lot of power behind you that you probably don't really need most of the time. But when you need to, it's like taking a shotgun and shooting a fly. Okay, It's very, very simple to use once you learn how to use it. So take a look at that if you're interested. Um, another important thing, test isolation. I talked before about uh, tests being uh, run and then suddenly failing, only failing when running in a specific order or only when the moon is full and all that stuff. That's usually a, a, a great uh, way to find out that your tests are not really isolated from each other. Isolation just means that the state, the universe in which a specific test exists, and another test universe are uh, overlapping. So when that te test changes state, let's say on a shared database, the other test also checks that same database. But they're not being uh, re uh, cleaned up or reset after or before each test. And that means that if they run, let's say one test inserts a row into the database and one test expects a specific row in the database. That would work in a specific uh, order. Change the order and suddenly you have a problem. Because the tests are not isolated. In fact, what you want to have each test do is to set up its own state and to roll back the state that it set, either in the end or to set up the test state at the beginning. Uh, well, usually both. Now, this only happens when you are either using statics or when using really external stuff. When you need to roll back state after each test, I think 90% of the time it means that you are using doing an integration test, really, because you're touching some external state. Um, here is an example. Um, just like you have a setup method, in the setup method, this is where a test could create all the state externally that it needs, like create rows in a database or whatever. But there's also a teardown method. A teardown method is known by having an attribute called teardown. The name doesn't matter on the method itself. Now in MS Test, there's uh, test uh, initialize and what was test cleanup. Hey, you did it! Congratulations, guys! To Ula. he actually just told me on the right time that there are only ten minutes left. Okay, you're gonna get a T-shirt. Okay, so if you have to remove something in the teardown, usually means you're doing an integration test. You probably want to move it into the different. Uh, into a different uh, project. Um, for example, if you're doing database tests, this is where, where you would roll back the database. If you are changing files on the file system, this is where you would um, uh, delete all the files that you created. Um, so what you want to be able to do is to run the test in any order that you want. Uh, you can just run any of them, and you would still get the same results every time. Test has to be repeatable in any order uh, and in any amount of tests. If they're not repeatable at some specific way, you probably have an isolation problem in your tests. And isolation problems are really, really difficult to solve. <coughs> it really does take a lot of time to, to find and fix those kind of things. Avoiding multiple asserts. Who asked that in the previous session? Where are you? He's not here. OK. Um, I, I try to avoid multiple asserts in tests, and the main reason is that having multiple asserts uh, and the first assert fails, it throws an exception. So the next asserts never run. You never know if they passed or failed. 
So only you only get a partial picture. Now in xunit.net, it's a, a new, relatively new test framework. You, there is a special API to run asserts where they won't fail. But I don't think the API is that usable or readable. I wouldn't recommend using that specific API. So I still think if you're doing multiple certs, most of the time you're testing multiple things. The only time your multiple certs are somehow make sense is when you're logically testing the same thing. For example, multiple properties on the same object. You got the right object back, so it has all these properties correctly. You can also replace that with one simple assert by creating an expected object with all the right properties and then asserting that the real object and the, new, the, the expected one are equal. That would be the same logical thing. If you can do that or something like that, it means you're OK. But most of the time, you don't have to do multiple asserts. And if you do, just make sure that you know that if you get an exception, you only get a partial picture. Readability, I've already talked about the readability of test names. I won't repeat that. Just once, you have the name of the method, you have the, uh, the scenario in which you're testing it, and you have the, uh, the expected behavior. If you lose just one of those things, you, the uh, reader of your test is going to have a hard time figuring out uh, what it is that uh, you're trying to test or what's supposed to happen. Now, if you're writing the same test with different parameters and you're not using the test case attribute like I showed, then just use the same name and put a number in the end. So that at least you have some numbering scheme so someone sees that, says, okay, this is just another angle of that other test. They're the same, just the parameters are different. As long as you're consistent about these things throughout the team, then the test will, c will remain readable. That's usually the, 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 the thing with conventions. They have to be consistent. If you don't use the conventions consistently, you're going to have a problem. Okay, one last thing. Uh, I once uh, came upon a test, and the name of the test was test something, one. And the test had an assert in the end that looked like this. Calc.parse takes minus one, returns 1,003. And I said, wow, I totally understand what it does. If you send minus one, you should be getting back 1,003. What is 1,003? What is that magic number? And the problem I have with tests is they should have no magic numbers, no magic strings, no magic values whatsoever. If, if there is some number or value there, and someone has to go and say, hmm, I wonder what that is, it's a magic something. OK, it's magical. You don't know what it does. You don't want to know. It's important, though. You want to put them in const so the test is more readable. Here's a more readable example of that. Okay, it's a bit more wordy, but if the test name sucks, at least you have this. I get the parse result, but I send in a negative illegal number. This is the scenario. The expected result is negative parse return code. Now, if the test name was okay, uh, it would somehow be readable, but I would still, if I was doing the test review for this, I would not be accepting these magic numbers and values. I would say put a const there. There is no reason to put a string there unless it's the most basic kind of stuff. For example, an empty string. Always use the simplest values that you can to send into a value under test, into a, in a method under test. It's just like if you, in loops, you don't have to declare names for i and j. i and j make sense. You know what it is. Then if you're testing something and you're using the simplest values, you don't have to give them const names. But 1,003, oh, do, <laughs> you really have to give that a name. And minus 1? Probably you have to give that a name as well. OK. Um, last thing, um, I always separate the assert from the action. I don't put the action inside the assert method. If I want to debug it later, just as an example, or I want to use the result from the action, uh, I want to be able to use that later. OK. Um, in the summary, uh, you, you've seen all these things. What I really want to cover is the fact that all these things have to go together. You remove one, the rest fall behind. And suddenly, you have all these tests failing, and your, your cost just went, uh, went up a lot. Went, it happened to us on a project. We lost a lot of weeks on uh, tests. We were writing horrible tests. At some point, we started, stopped maintaining them. 
and all that work was just lost and we stopped getting all that feedback. No time for questions because I promised a couple of songs. Um, okay. For uh, my song, I would need a volunteer. Now, uh, thank you. So, what's your name? Huh? Bure? Huh? Huh? Okay. Please welcome Bure. I noticed you all speak with a question mark in the end, right? Bure. I was in Flure in Oslo. It's also like a drum roll. Bure. Ah, I get it. Do you know what to do? You don't hold anything. You just need to press space. Not yet, though. And now, as I sing the words, by the way, for helping me, you're going to get one of my books, ladies and gentlemen. You I just got my book. This. There you go. You. Um, put it away, though. I need your help, though. Um, I just want to explain what this song is about. And then you can all go to another session. Um, let me see if this... Okay, not yet. This song is about um, a team I was in. And we had a developer that wrote really horrible code. And he didn't believe in unit tests or whatever. And we had to keep, you know, following his code and debug it and fix it. Uh, he worked there for about 20 years, so we can get rid of him. Now, I'm not saying 20 years is not a good thing. I'm saying that if you hire a developer with 20 years experience, make sure they did not repeat the same year 20 times, okay? <laughs> compile this testing is not your style and you tell us how much time you saved but then while you're away we debug your code all day to without all the bugs that it has go all that source code That source code, will you ever change? We pretend you've been fired or hopefully retired. It's never too early to quit. And then while you're away, we write tests every day. So the source code. much guys um, you want to do another song you got a book let's do another song I promised two songs let's do another book uh, no 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 another book I'm sorry okay let me just uh, switch to the other talk by the way that's my son um, where is that uh, this is understanding TDD and let me see we should have a song somewhere here. Okay, there you go. Now, this is my book, by the way. I have already tested you, no need. Okay. Uh, this is a song that I wrote. I also wrote the music. Um, hey, can you move the mouse just so it doesn't interfere? Okay. This is about a manager I had. He didn't like me writing tests whatsoever. Go. Every build you break, refactoring you make, every mock you fake, you little snake, I'll be watching you. 
every stand-up meeting I believe you're cheating Every unit test pains my chest I'll be watching you This is hard Oh, can't you see? Nothing comes for free Every test you write Continuous integration Now the clients hear Everything they hear Man, it bothers me Oh, can't you see This is scaring me It would be so strange If my job will change Every build you break, every mark you fake, every test you make, I'll be watching you. Every build you break, every mark you fake, every test you make, I'll be watching you. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. And I'll see you. Up there, I'm doing the uh, beautiful Teams talk. I think in like three minutes. How much time do I have, Ula? <laughs>